there, there's many different ways of roasting the coffee. Uh, we have the hot chew method. There's a the Teochew method, the Hainanese method. Uh, largely in Singapore, a lot of uh, coffee shops started in the 1930s. Uh, if you trace back to history, that was during the Great Depression. Uh, very similar similar situation that we are facing right now with COVID. Um, everything, you know, the, um, there's a lot of startup. Back then, there started grants even. Uh, they were giving like $300, you can start a coffee shop. Right, tables and chairs, all in, uh, you just need the hot water. The, 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 cough, the, the, the method of a Hainanese came because the Hainanese were largely working on the plantation fields in the rubber tapping industry. They were actually helping the British to do the rubber. And in the past, Singapore was actually a top exporter for rubber in the world. We, we actually created the, innovated the most uh, efficient way of tapping rubber. Yeah, we were even doing more than Malaysia. Right. But we made a conscious choice to change the industry to fit because of our flaw area and the population growth in the industry. Uh, then the Great Depression hit, uh, the motor car industry was that we had thought had to close their factories. Uh, nobody was buying cars, right? So nobody was making tires anymore. That's when the rubber industry got hit. So we, the, the Hainanese people who were largely on the plantations, in, in, they were actually forced to change Overnight, they took the knowledge that they were, they, they were when they were working for the British in their, cook, in their homes, um, they were cooking Hainanese pork chops with your yeah, chicken rice, right? These were all variations of the, the British cuisines and they, they translated it to a local context. Now, the, the robusta beans that were actually grown here in Singapore, actually Singapore's climate is very perfect for green coffee. Orchard used to be a, a belt for it. Um, the beans were actually discarded by the British. The Arabica beans were taken and sold back home. Now, in, then what our forefathers did was they realized that the beans were spoiled very fast here because of, we have the four elements that's very bad for coffee, moisture, heat, sunlight, um, and even um, we are surrounded by sea water. Right? All these elements actually attack the coffee very quickly, it spoils. So they, they used the method of butter and sugar to roast it. And that's how the Hainanese roast actually came about. So um, from, from roasting, it actually creates a coat to, to protect your coffee like a, like a uh, armor over the beans. And that's why right, you notice that in your coffee shops, most of them actually don't have a grinder. They actually have a meal, uh, a peanut meal actually used to be for grinding nuts. Because if you use a, even a $4,000 uh, muzzle grinder, it's a high-end Italian meat, it will burn. Yeah, the sugar will just jam the whole bowls together. Everything will work in flames. Yeah, so, um, the, the, and this is unique in Singapore. Um, the Malaysian way of roasting coffee, totally different. Yeah, it's not the same. Um, the the Hokchu's way of roasting coffee from Hainan is very different also because the timing when they pull the coffee, uh, when I say pool, it means um, they usually have a hot bit of beans actually roasting on top. And they will drop it down into a large tray. And that's when they go in to use their hands to fold with the stick to actually break it up. Now that, 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 that timing of catching the roast right, requires a lot of guts. Um, the difference of that burning the whole batch of beans, which is almost your entire uh, margin right, for the coffee, uh, it's just a matter of minutes. You just need to mix it up by one or two minutes, the entire batch goes chart. It's like charcoal, you can throw away the whole batch. Now corn is even harder to roast. Uh, and, and that's when, the, in the later stage, green beans, corn, coconut, uh, many different kinds of other corns were being experimented and innovated to use to create different flavors. Everybody wanted to be special. Yeah, and that's how you get the different kind of roast. Now you find, you know, not South East West, when you go around, you realize that Every region in Singapore has a different characteristics of their coffee and the kopi diams too. Yeah, they, they kind of, um, the taste gradually changes as you go towards the east. It changes as you go towards the west. Yeah, and, 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 and culturally, if you look, you look at it, um, it, it's largely influenced by ingredients also. But um, what's, what's accessible to them back then? Yeah. I, I, hope I, just want, I just want to say as someone who makes maps, 
I'm really intrigued and would love to make a map of coffee taste in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, <true>. just, <laughs> okay, um, just now I think Han Zhong asked a question in the chat. He asked you, um, he asked for Benjamin's view on articles and then he put a link. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think that one we have to take it private it. Uh, because you can read the articles. You know? yeah. yeah. Or maybe Han Chong, you want to like voice yeah. your question? Summarize. Yeah. Sure. I mean, this is something that I think most of us may have heard of, of how uh, different parts of the tongue are sensitive to different tastes. Uh. So that's the second reference to the tongue map. So why essentially uh, some of these articles uh, actually are presenting that, that that is actually a very, very, uh, it's basically an urban myth that uh, our tongues have different uh, sensory perceptions or receptors. Right. Basically they are fairly uniform, except maybe some parts of the tongue are more sensitive like the tip and the back. Yeah, but it's not true that, you know, that only some parts can taste salty. Happen. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So, so I was just wondering whether you're informed by this understanding or, you know, uh, how does um, that, uh, how does that uh, inform your practice, for example? He, honestly, this is my first time hearing this also. <laughs> I, I learned something new today. Um, to, to me, right, ultimately, food should be kept simple. Now. I also do not want to make it so scientific, but when I talk about that, that, that euphoria usually that people talk about that unami kind of thing, um, I think that experience also goes on the full palette at the end of the day, right? You can't just say, I just taste something with one part of my tongue. Yeah, um, my, my chef in particular, uh, Sebastian, he, he actually has a very sensitive taste bud. And um, I think that's, that's important for a chef. And he, he actually protects. He tells me in this always that he guts his um, taste bud a lot, which means he don't take spicy food. He tries to be very careful with what he takes, and especially with children. Also, he always tells me to avoid certain foods so to ensure that they you don't spoil the taste buds. Because the moment you you start to have problems tasting certain things, you start to slide towards something more. Yeah, which uh, then that that amounts to you eating something that might not be healthy sometimes. Huh? So uh, he, he always tells me this, that locally here in Singapore, he feels personally, and this is not an attack on anyone, but he, he feels that a lot of people don't um, know how to taste as well. And he says that to me too. I think because of the coffee, um, we, we, we don't understand the, the taste beyond the dimension of just, you know, Shuan Ku La, right? salty dinner, sweet. He, he, he always emphasized to me about the mixing of the different kind of layers and how does that give a, a, a different dimension in you as we eat. Um, how does the ingredient translate when you put it in earlier? Do you taste it? How much of it? Uh, because if you don't, like, it means you're wasting the ingredient. Right? Uh, and, and nowadays when you see people doing um, you know your your like if you go to some of those street markets, they, they, they place tons of sugar loaded kind of stuff over mixed with so many ingredients that you can't even taste what it is anymore. Um, he gets very agitated with it. And um, I, I personally think, uh, to me, it's more of a health uh, coach. For him, he, he always shares with me, it's more of a um, waste of an ingredient. Um, you are not doing justice to whoever who, who went through the effort to grow it. Same, similarly like coffee when we spend the effort growing, right? And if I, I see somebody taking the coffee grounds and making a really terrible cup of coffee with it, it, it gets on my nerves a little bit. <laughs> yeah, because you're wasting the effort of thousands of people to actually get that bean to you from, from farm to table. Yeah. I, I, sorry, I can't see the comments. You can just uh, air it out. Maybe it's easier for me. I think there's one question uh, from uh, Oilian. Uh, she said uh, her mother actually brew coffee black and put it in right. a thermal flask and uh, it didn't turn sour. But nowadays, the coffee black that yes. you know, she put in the thermal turns sour. Why is that so? Right. 
a lot to do with the blend that you use. Now, the, the, if there's corn in there, definitely it will turn sour. This I can guarantee you. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, I mean, when the, even the, the guys who sell the coffee, they might not know whether is there corn in there because it comes to them grounded in powder. Yeah. Uh, so it's about sometimes about the purity of the coffee. So the, the, the type of beans that are being used also in harvest, it degrades over time. Actually, there is a problem in the, if you go to coffee forums and all, you will hear of a problem of um, coffee bean quality, the genes actually getting messed up. Uh, people have been doing a lot of cross-breeding and marketing and actually um, using different ways to grow the coffee too. Now, um, the, the quality of the beans actually going down over the years. Uh, all the different kind of fertilizers that they're using. Um, it's, it's a capitalist problem that actually has created this. Um, people are buying islands to monopolize the market. So the, the accessibility to beans is becoming an issue. Uh, not only just here in, here in Singapore. Uh, Starbucks actually secures islands for coffee, uh, for certain taste profile that they want to prevent the market from from uh, having a similar blend. Now, when that happens, right, sometimes uh, 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 a roast that you might, uh, a local roast might actually be sourcing from some of these islands here in Indonesia. They, they lose that bean profound, that the taste change. Yeah, um, acidity in coffee actually is normal for certain regions. Actually, when you're in the tropical region, it goes up a little bit, especially the elevation of the coffee also. If it's on a lower elevation, the amount of acidity should goes up also. And it depends on what's going next door. Um, sometimes if you have chocolate next door, your coffee has chocolate taste in it and aroma in it also. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's one of those that a lot of people prize for. They don't hope, oh, I hope my, my, this, this batch of beans are like, their chocolate tea taste. So some, some would say uh, there's Milo in it. I actually know it, was, it came from the plantation when they were growing. Uh, there were some people who were telling me people put uh, milk powder. Uh, yeah, to, to, to get a milky taste in the coffee. Like, you know, that's the secret ingredient. They put kids milk powder in there. Uh, actually, the, the, the creaminess comes from certain fruits or, or other things that they were growing around them at that point of time. Yeah. So the understanding of what's growing around you actually helps a lot. Uh, berries actually give a lot more uh, fruitiness, tart taste kind of the coffee. Yeah.